Hi everyone, it's me, Krillius, Team Racing Productions co-host and moderator. And joining me right now is the goddess of DC, Racine Pendarvis. Bam! Greetings and salutations all. Joining us is the DC Council Member representing Ward 4 on the Council of the District of Columbia, Janice Lewis George. Welcome. Thank you. So happy to be here. Such a pleasure to have you here. Now, before we talk about pending legislation and other topics, please tell the viewers a little bit about your background and who you are. Um, well, my name is Janice Lewis George. I am a third generation Washingtonian. I'm a proud DC public school graduate. Um, I'm a native of Ward 4, so I was born and raised in Ward 4 on 2nd and Kennedy Street. I proudly represent Uptown, and uh, I um, am also a proud graduate of Howard University School of Law, so H-U. you know. <laughs> uh, and prior to uh, joining the council, I served as uh, an assistant attorney general here in the District of Columbia. Uh, and it is just an honor of my lifetime to serve my home city and my home ward. I love it. I love it. Welcome back to the Team Racing YouTube channel. We're so happy to have you back here. Of course, we previously interviewed you as a candidate, as a nominee, and as a council member elect in 2020. In the nearly three years since you became a member of the DC Council, what are some of the lessons you've learned and how has serving on the DC Council changed you as a person? Oh man, this is a great question. Lessons I have learned. Um, you know, I think I've learned that you have to be persistent and consistent. Uh, it is so important that you, every time you want something done for your community, um, you have to make sure you are consistently getting feedback from the community. Um, and then you have to be persistent to make sure uh, that agencies are delivering for, for you and your constituents. And so I tell people, it's not just the initial email, the initial phone call, it's the follow-up email, the follow-up phone call. You have to be persistent and consistent in, in the work you do. Um, other lessons I think that I have learned is really just, um, you know, you gotta be intentional about getting feedback, you know, and not everybody down here in the Wilson building, you know, you, you get people who come to the building, but that's the people who have time to come down to the building. But there are so many residents where it's so much better to reach them where they are. And so you have to be intentional about going to the community um, and reaching people where they are, because that's where you're gonna get the most, the, the real authentic feedback from um, communities. Um, and so you just can't sit here in the building. You really gotta get out there and. Be be, on the, be in the community and out on the streets consistently. Um, and I think, you know, the last thing I would say is, you know, um, you, you got to have courage. Um, you know, there are a lot of tough votes that you take here at the council. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, tough decisions that come by you. Um, and you got to remember the mandate that people have for you to come in here and represent everybody and do the work. And uh, you got to have that courage to do so. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that that's what I've learned, how I've changed. Um, I would say I'm as optimistic as I was before. Um, I would say I've had to learn balance a lot more. I mean, my first my first year in office, I mean, I sort of ran myself ragged and was at every meeting, doing everything. I was working 14 hour days, all, working weekends, Saturday, Sundays. And, you know, there's a point where I wasn't, you know, I was just making sure I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't making sure I was eating right. I wasn't going to the gym. I wasn't, you know, spending the time I needed to with my family. And so I think um, it's a lot to balance, but I think the greatest thing I've had to learn in this lesson is, you know, you can't, you can't serve from an empty cup. Um, and you gotta, you gotta take care of yourself if you're going to take care of others. Um, and so as I'm entering, you know, my, this year, I'm finally, I am finally at a place of balance and it literally took me three years to finally say, Hey, you got to take care of yourself if you're going to take care of others. Um, and so that, that's been one of the lessons. And that's Great so important to learn. Yes. So, so important. Take care of self. <laughs> 
and, and talking about that, what have you enjoyed the most about being a council member? Oh, oh man, everything. I'm having, a, I'm having so much fun. That's what I tell people. I'm having a great time. I think what I've enjoyed most is when I see um, a legislation passed or a budget initiative done, and I just see the tangible results. Um, when we raise the wages for early childhood educators, and I just remember early childhood educators who like got their first checks, just like literally in tears, you know, getting funding. Um, we were able to make sure librarians stayed in schools, just getting, you know, calls and hugs from librarians saying, thank you. I, I didn't want to leave DC public school system. I wanted to stay and I love these kids. Um, I guess it's just the tangible things that when, you know, it, it's one thing when it's in paper and you're, you know, but it's the other thing when it really happens um, and you get to see the results of, of, of an effort that you put forward. That has been the most, I think, rewarding um, aspect. Uh, when I see a, a school now with speed humps, I do literally all the way here. I was like, look at my school got speed humps. They got their, their flasher beacon lights and just, just the, the tangible, uh, re rewards of that. Um, and then I love hanging out. It's like the two polar opposites. I love hanging out with my young people and I love hanging out with my seniors. I mean, it's just, both of them are just honest, right? So <laughs> you will see me sometimes. I'll be at like a game. You know, I go to the Roosevelt game, the Coolidge games. I show up at the soccer games. I just love our young people. And so when I get to interact with them, they just, they're so honest and authentic. It makes you feel good. And, you know, our seniors, they always got the tea, you know, so, and they always go tell you the truth too. So, you know, I love, you know, Mother's Day brunch, your Father's Day celebration. So, yeah, I think also hanging out with the young people and hanging out with our seasoned citizens are like also the icing on the cake um, of, of, of doing this work. And that's wonderful. That's so important. And when you talk about your seniors, when I run into you at all the senior functions. That's I'm, right. That's right. <laughs> of you, honey. And that's a wonderful thing because you know the seniors vote, baby. <laughs> they do. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, here's what. Let us get into some policy and pending legislation. So, Please tell us why you think that DC students would benefit from being taught conflict resolution in our schools. Yes, I just this is so critical. Um, conflict resolution education comes in many different forms, but it's a root about teaching children how to manage their emotions, de-escalate difficult situations, um, and just peacefully resolve the conflicts that arise in, in and out of schools as a part of their daily lives. You know, young people in D.C. are facing more pressure um, and anxiety than ever before, and there is an increase in violence that is impacting our youth. Just a couple of weeks ago, we saw a youth got a stabbing over sweet and sour sauce in a McDonald's, right? Like, oh, yes. Right. It's so more and more we're seeing small arguments between students escalate and turn violent, and we need to make sure that every student feels safe and supported. And so teaching conflict resolution from a young age instills lifelong skills that really will help our children overcome conflict, improve behavior in their classroom, um, and make our schools and our community safer. And we're talking about sort of, you know, a solution to, to really root causes of conflict and violence in the city. And this it's an incredible part about conflict resolution education that it's already happening sort of in select schools and it's already making a difference in the lives of those children. And so my legislation would basically apply those same lessons so that every student in DC can benefit. And so at the elementary, middle school and high school level, you will be learning, you'll be mandated that you learn conflict resolution skills at every level so that we have young people who grow into adults who can handle their emotions and, and solve conflicts uh, that and in a way that does not end in, in violence. And that's amazing on so many levels when you talk about that, because their era is the world that I didn't have. You know, it is the world of social media and mm -hmm. how everything that happens mm -hmm. in a second, it goes worldwide. You know, we didn't have that when we were coming up in school. You know, something happened, you know, you know, it was like, oh, God, you didn't hear about it until like, you know. Right. It, was, like, hey. <laughs> it went along the grapevine. <laughs> it went along the grapevine, but now... Yeah, yeah. They got social media pages, you know, where they just, where you can see fights and some fights escalate out of social media. Somebody said something on somebody on a live. I can't tell you how many times that that has been an incident, incident that had happened in our war where someone got on live and, and taunted another person and they said, well, you pull up. And then we had a shooting, you know, so it's, 
It's crazy. It's real. I mean, I remember when I was in high school, Gossip Girl was on TV and people would make <laughs> Facebook pages and to like out people, expose people, do all that. So maybe that I haven't been on Facebook since 2013 because of it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so because our are in this age, we got to teach them conflict resolution skills mm -hmm. and handle and deal with these emotions um, in a way that is it is productive and positive. Yeah, and, and talking about learning and the importance of education and the importance of uh, this wonderful uh, bill you introduced. Please tell us about the propose to bring a new DC Public Library to Ward Four. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I grew up on Kennedy Street. Um, so this is just so deeply personal for me, um, having grown up on Kennedy Street, you know, at a time where, you know, people would just talk about the sort of what was happening there from a negative standpoint. And we always felt like sort of a left behind neighborhood that didn't have resources um, that we wanted to have for our community. And so um, the uh, library system actually did a study and found where were their gaps in library resources and services. And, and lo and behold, they identified the Kennedy Street area as a neighborhood that uh, had a resource gap, a library service gap, and that would benefit from it because of uh, the diversity. This is an area with a high concentration of young children, high concentration of immigrants, job seekers, uh, lower income families, single parent households, um, and many child care centers and schools. And so uh, despite the vast needs, Kennedy Shorter Street has been sort of systemic, systemically underinvested in over decades and passed up for public resources that other neighborhoods sort of take for granted. And so that is exacerbated. Many of the issues that Kennedy Street faces now from blighted buildings to public safety. And so um, as one community member shared recently at one of the hearings, they said right now it's easier to buy a beer on Kennedy Street than it is to get a book. And so we want to change that. And right. And so a public library in Kennedy Street could bring other badly needed resources to our community, like affordable housing. Um, and we're looking at co-locating housing and DCPL library. Um, when you think about a library, that's a place where people can go print. Everybody doesn't have printer, doesn't have ink, where people have Wi-Fi. Internet is a luxury that some people take for granted, but it costs a lot for families to have Wi-Fi and internet um, in their homes. Even on days where it's hot, some people don't have the benefit of having air that, that works and having air conditioning. So um, in so many of our community meetings take have to take place on Kennedy Street outside. And so when it rains, we you know, not, we, it sort of goes up. And so this is an investment. Overall, I think a public library would uplift our community with public resources and positive activities um, and it'll help our community thrive. And so now we've put the money in the budget and uh, we are excited uh, for the next steps. Um, everybody in the community across the board, this is the first time I mean, everybody is like, yes, let's do this. Our small businesses um, and so many of our neighborhood partners are really excited about this coming to Kennedy Street. Oh, I love it. And you know what they say, reading is fundamental, darling. That's right. <laughs> so hope hopefully they have my book in there so the girls can feel their fantasy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, could you briefly tell us about the recently reintroduced legislation to combat lead contamination? That's right. So I put together, we did a Green New Deal for Lead Free DC um, this spring to basically accelerate the removal of hazardous lead water service lines um, in, in on our public uh, properties. Um, we had a hearing uh, and received widespread support, but the legislation basically would streamline lead pipe replacement in DC and address all of the lead pipes that we currently have. There are more than 40,000 lead pipes in the district and DC water is really only on pace to replace a fraction of those by uh, uh, this decade, you know, by the end of this decade. And so we're making some progress, but it's not nearly fast enough to protect our communities. Uh, lead in water particularly um, impacts young children um, and has devastating effects on young children uh, in their early ages. It can create uh, developmental issues, behavioral health issues, chronic uh, health conditions. Um, and uh, it also impacts expectant mothers. As you know, we have a maternal health crisis um, and we have to make sure that we're doing all our can to curb that. And when uh, expectant mothers uh, have lead water in, uh, and, and ingest it, it impacts not only them, but the children um, and our seniors. Uh, lead in water impacts our seniors' health and their ability to battle uh, 
uh, with any chronic health conditions that may arise. And so, you know, for me, it's it's a public health issue, but it's also an opportunity. DC is receiving significant federal funds for lead pipe replacement. Uh, President Biden even said in his State of the Union, we need to replace lead pipes across the U.S. And so right here in DC is where we need to do it. Um, and we also added a job component to include new job training programs through the DC Infrastructure Academy as a core part of a legislation so that we make sure we create green jobs and union jobs. We work with the unions um, so that when we do this, we have credible messengers who get a community benefit out of doing this. Um, Newark actually did this and they replaced all their lead pipes within two years and created green jobs. And those green jobs were credible messengers from their community. So uh, I believe the district is on, can do this. Um, and th with this legislation moving forward, we'll have the ability uh, to streamline this process um, and also create green jobs for our community. Wow, that, that's a mouthful. And, and you know, Lydia, you know, the work is always ongoing. You have to make sure that we have a better world, a better life for everyone. And let's talk a little bit about the housing bill that you yeah. recently reintroduced. <laughs> Listen, the Green New Deal for housing is so important. Uh, uh, this, is, this is, I think... Honestly, like many of us, I grew up in a neighborhood in D.C. where working families could afford to live, but that's not the D.C. that we have today. And every year there are fewer and fewer neighborhoods and districts that are actually affordable and there will not be any left unless we do something drastically different. And so uh, one of the ways we do that is really by creating new tools to create affordable housing in this city. Uh, and that one of those tools is a Green New Deal for housing, which is revolutionizing how the district produces and preserves affordable housing by creating sustainable, climate neutral social housing. And social housing really is publicly owned mixed income housing that generates deeply affordable uh, housing by reinvesting rent payments and lowering costs for tenants um, and establishing more housing across the district. Um, and so uh, social housing, you know, we we have uh, people are doing it across the, the country. Our neighbors in Montgomery County are doing it. You know, sometimes the district gives away land uh, here in the district for a dollar, 99 year lease to developers so that they can create more affordable housing. And I think that's one tool. If we add social housing, that means we as the district say we're going to use some of that those dollars and create housing ourselves um, and uh, make it more affordable because profit is not at the center of it. At that point, it's housing as a public good. And so we just, I am very adamant about adding this to our toolbox. We need to do everything we can to create more affordable housing. Um, and we need working families to be able to live in the district because that impacts our city agencies. We, When we have a, a crisis in our city around vacancies in government, the number one reason people are leaving or leaving the leaving government or leaving DC or not coming here is affordable housing. So we have to do our best. And social housing is one of the ways we create this mixed income, deeply affordable, publicly owned housing um, that allows us to lower costs uh, and, and focus on, um, you know, making sure we have the community uh, that that the city um, is made of. Certainly, certainly. I mean, so many people can't live here anymore and so many people want to live here and are not able to live here. So that is certainly something that is so important. Please, council member, tell our viewers how they can learn more about you, what you're doing on the DC council and how they can keep up with you and everything that you've got going on. Right. So you can go to my website, which is JaniceWard4.com. And when you go to that website, make sure you sign up for my newsletter. I do a newsletter every Friday, giving people updates. Um, you can also follow me on at council member Lewis George Ward 4 W4 or Janice for DC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. How about that? <laughs> That's so important. And viewers, please look in the description below for links. And thank you for joining us, council member. Thank you. <laughs> to those watching, please follow Team Racing Productions on social media and click around our YouTube channel and check out our other interviews, vlogs, forums, and more. And while you're at it, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. And what do you want to say to our viewers, Racine? Thank you for watching. <laughs>